Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We will talk about hormone therapy and Alzheimer's risk. And we wanted to speak about this subject particularly because recently a paper was published in the British Medical Journal that showed that when women are on hormone replacement therapy, they may be at a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Now this this topic, the hormone therapy and its relationship with the development or prevention of Alzheimer's disease is a very complex one. And there's been a lot of contradictory information over the years. So we wanted to take some time to discuss the importance of hormone therapy during menopause and you know postmenopausal era. And we also wanted to kind of take a deep dive into you know, the disparities that men and women have as far as risk of Alzheimer's disease is concerned. We wanted to touch on the effect of sex hormones during the different stages of life on brain and brain health. Um, we also wanted to discuss some of the evidence from the different studies that look at the risk of development of neurodegenerative diseases in women who uh, are on hormone replacement therapy. Uh, also discuss the contradictions in the study, um, discuss this particular paper that recently came out and most importantly, something that I'm really interested in is why is there a difference between observational animal and treatment studies when it comes to this topic? Mm -hmm. This is a, a tremendously important topic because every woman throughout their life will go through this transition and they will have the choice of using or not using these uh, uh, HRTs. And it, it, independent of the cognitive effects, it has an effect on every system in the body. So we really need to know why um, uh, this, this contradiction exists. We need to figure out quickly how and when and, and, and what degree and to whom these hormone uh, replacement therapy should be uh, provided uh, because we think that it has a, a tremendous effect. And as when we, when we talk about the transitions and how these hormones affect the brain at different stages of life, you'll see it's it's a dominant feature. It's a dominant determinant of not just you know um, um, the neuronal state, but also growth of the brain uh, throughout uh, the, these phases. In fact, there's a part that you see apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. Um, so I think there has to be more investment in this. Like you said, there has to be more um, work done to get the details and, and intricacies. And uh, this will be one of hopefully many other uh, talks that will go into depth of this topic. Absolutely. So let's start by discussing why do we see um, sex disparity in Alzheimer's disease? Now, there have been multiple hypotheses. Um, one of the most common hypotheses is that women tend to live longer than men, and that may increase their lifetime risk for Alzheimer's disease. What do we know about that, Dean? Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, women are at twice the risk of, uh, the, compared to men, of Alzheimer's and many of the other dementias. In fact, two thirds of all Alzheimer's cases are women. women yeah. uh, that's that's uh, a, a incredible burden uh, to the uh, to to the families because the caregivers are also women. Yeah. So we there's a whole uh, population out there that that is devastated by this and we don't talk about it if, if 6.9 million Americans are suffering from Alzheimer's right now uh, two-thirds of them are women and that means that all those households are to a great extent paralyzed or affected or in pain or suffering or um, uh, don't have the resources and nobody talks about it mm -hmm. and, and 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 on top of that, the research that needs to be dedicated to to women's um, health is not there. Absolutely. There isn't that, that level of specificity. And whenever I talk about that level of specificity, whether it's women or, or the, you know, the different races, it's it's both good for the, that particular community, but also great for the greater community because that specific population can give us insights into the bigger disease. Agreed. So the life and women, you know, like you said, I want to get back to why the lifelong uh, risk is higher, because first of all, they live six, five to six years longer than men. Oh, is it which, five to six years? Yeah. In well, some series, they actually mention ten years. No, well, oh, they they're saying it's actually less than that. I it's see. five to six okay. years, um, uh, and um, and so that means that that's that, but that's quite significant. Really and now that five to six years is uh, means that they have five to six years greater risk, especially at the tail end of life, where if you're not 
taking care of your health, you're not living a healthy life, which at this point, uh, hopefully most people are listening to us to understand what that means, nutrition, exercise, all of those things, that cumulative damage actually gets accelerated. So there's then therefore we're going to see the effects of those cumulative negative lifestyles uh, more. Mm -hmm. um, and the most common of these is the vascular risk factors, which is diabetes, cholesterol, high blood pressure, uh, microvascular disease. All of those things also accumulate five to six years more. Right. So if there was anybody on the precipice, on the edge of developing cognitive decline, for men, a lot of them don't live long enough to see that. In women, you actually see the manifestation. So that's one of them. But when they, uh, but but when they looked at the data, although that did explain a, a, some of the uh, uh, disparity, some of the greater risk, it's not the total picture. There's more to it than just um, the greater lifetime risk. That's true. That's true. Uh, um, I wanted to add something um, to your previous statement of um, research and women's uh, research when it comes to brain health. There is a gross um, underrepresentation of women in general, and definitely when it comes to women of color and from different backgrounds, we really need to emphasize that moving forward because most of the studies, particularly observational studies that have come to us, they were, you know, more men than than women so hopefully we can change that and i know that there's a lot of conversation about um representation of women in research for brain health and i'll take it even uh, one step further um the caregivers are women that's true so if you're not if we're not going to take care of the caregivers there's a problem in society and on top of that the the change agent the change agents are women as well Meaning that whenever we actually talk about lifestyle change, the first population we go to, because that's the population that truly implements lifestyle, are women. Now, that's not putting down men. I'm a man, and, and I recognize that. There are men do a lot of the change as well. I've seen these amazing men that they've changed their diet and have cleaned their diet and exercised in their 60s and 70s. But there's no question. Statistics shows that the dominant population that actually brings the change are the women. Absolutely. Whether it's on the plant predominant diet, it's what is it, eighty percent women. Whether it's uh, uh, starting exercise programs in the community, the walking groups here in Redondo are led by women. So it's uh, so we really have to start focusing on 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 the women for many many reasons for a greater society. Another factor that brings in this disparity in Alzheimer's is the stress of pregnancy. Um, so pregnancy, particularly multiple pregnancies. Um, definitely change the body and it can increase stress levels and changes in metabolism. And this changes the risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. In some research uh, papers, they've indicated that multiparous women or women who have had multiple pregnancies may potentially be protected from Alzheimer's disease compared to those who don't have multiple pregnancies or no pregnancies at all. Now, this is a very complex relationship because it also affects the onset of menopause. When menopause starts, whether it's earlier in life or later in life, affects how much the brain is exposed to estrogen and progesterone. And it seems Right now, this is a trend. Of course, there are some contradictions, but the later the menopause is, the more protected the brain is. The longer or the later? The later. So be, it okay. means, you know, the, the more exposed your brain is to uh, hormones. Yes. The later your menopause is, the more protected you are from Alzheimer's exactly. disease. Exactly. Exactly. But again, this is just from observational studies, and we don't really have any mechanistic data that proves that. And that might be part of it from a survival bias because uh, women that survive the pregnancies and have gone through the stresses that haven't had things like eclampsia and preeclampsia where the blood pressures go sky high, proteins and the urine and the eclampsia so even have seizures. That Imagine that. Um, and that, 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 that combination can significantly increase risk of uh, brain disease and other things. But for those who don't and have had successful uh, pregnancies, then there is a bias towards um, uh, improvement. Yes. The next hypothesis is education, level of education. It's a big now, one. this is something that you and I have talked about in the past. Some people have, you know, really were fascinated by the topic and some people were kind of offended by it too. But when when you look at data that has been uh, you know, that has been shared with us that were implemented say in the 1950s or 60s and 70s, 
during those times, women were not exposed to as much education as men were. And this could potentially be a proxy for cognitive resilience. Um, and historically, women who have had less access to education than men, particularly in those cohort studies, are now older and they may be at more risk for Alzheimer's disease. There's no question about the education component. We, 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 it's such a powerful variable that there's no study that doesn't control for it, that doesn't account for it. So when, whenever somebody comes in, we, we always ask, uh, what level of education has, have you achieved? Obviously, education is not the main thing. It's the level of mental activity, but it's a really good marker. So it's a, and a consistent marker that we use. So uh, when we, I mean, consistently, you, you've seen this. When we have people, individuals that come that have a second grade education only or a grade school education, their risk of dementia is significantly higher later in life. Agreed. Yes. Profoundly higher. Um, and, and of course, that's more complicated. It's not just education. It's the situation that led to that as well. But even when you isolate, it's large enough data to look at education as a tremendous uh, variable. And consistent with education is mental activity, really ch challenging mental activity. People that have lived a life full of challenging, purpose-driven mental activity were significantly protected. And that there's no doubt of that. Their studies repeatedly have shown that. Our uh, meta-analysis showed this. So education definitely, at least for the cohort that's coming to us now in their 80s, seemed to be one of the variables. And you know, there was a time when you and I used to argue which factor was more important for yeah. brain health. And I was always, you know, big proponent of nutrition. Not that I'm not a proponent of nutrition, but after reading so much and after really becoming more and more in tune with the risk factors that women have in their lifetime, I've become a big believer of mental activity and building cognitive resilience as an incredible protective force for Absolutely. women. So, you know, and, and we also did a reel on that, to sh yeah. you know, as, as one of the answers to women who said, how do you, how does a woman over 50 keep herself healthy, brain healthy? And the first and the foremost thing is engaging in cognitive activities and yeah. building reserve. All right, the next hypothesis is women are less physically active compared to men. Now, we- That's gonna get a lot of women angry. Like, well, <laughs> women work a lot at well, home or out, outside of the home. But I, I think we're talking about something different. Uh, yes, and, and the trends have shifted. More and more women are physically active now and they have become physically active knowing from some of the studies that it really protects us. Um, and we all know the phenomenal uh, effect of physical activity on reducing the risk of Alzheimer's disease. But uh, older women particularly tend to be less active mm -hmm. compared to men, and this could increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Correct. Right. Um, the next hypothesis is hormonal changes, and this is the very subject of our conversation. So uh, throughout a woman's life, they go through hormonal changes, particularly during um, pregnancy and menopause. And of course, during these changes, there's going to be fluctuation in estrogen levels, and especially after menopause, there's going to be a decrease in menopause. And this has been associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Now, this relationship is pretty complex and it's multifaceted, and we will discuss that more. Let's talk about genetic factors. Now, we've talked about the importance of um, ApoE4 allele, which is a well-known genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease. And people who have ApoE4, whether it's one copy or two copies, it, it appears to confer a higher risk in mm -hmm. women than in men. And it has to do with, uh, of course, you know, affecting their vascular risk factors, uh, in particular, cholesterol metabolism. And there is a very close relationship between ApoE4 and estrogen fluctuation in our body. So coming back to the vascular risk factors, do we think that vascular changes become more prominent in women after their menopause because of this complex relationship between ApoE, ApoE4, and increased uh, um, LDL cholesterol and damage to the small vasculature in the brain and potentially increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. It's kind of complex. It but is I think complex. That, yeah. that does play a major role. But they've seen that when they've accounted for everything else, ApoE4 in itself is actually a greater risk for women than it is to men. Exactly. Yes, yeah. definitely. So, so we can control. If, if the study is large enough, you can control for all the variables. 
So it appears that uh, I mean, women, it's an independent risk factor, a uh, um, greater risk factor for women than, than men. So I want to pause here because, you know, people are listening to us and we kind of laid out all of these different factors. If there were certain things that we wanted to communicate with women right now, so say, for example, we have an audience of women who are between the ages of 40 and, say, 55. They're kind of in that very important <clears throat> transition in their life, both physiological and neurological transitions where there's fluctuation in hormones, what do they need to pay attention to the most? So uh, that's a great question. So here's some clues to change your life, independent of the hormone variable that will tremendously affect your brain health. And then whatever that relationship with, with the, uh, is with the hormone will, will, will manifest. But at least exercise absolutely move 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 and and even recently a paper came out that people who do gardening actually have more protection there was a time we used to make fun of gardening i'm not don't get offended i love gardening I've well killed... you are a serial plant killer so uh, oh that's you know. me yeah that's you <laughs> that became... okay <laughs> well okay. both are i suppose <laughs> yeah yeah so um I've, I've killed many a garden so i love <laughs> gardens um but uh, but reality is um uh, the more the better um, the more non-traumatic, the better. Bicycling, swimming, uh, uh, fast walking. Uh, you have to get tired. Uh, you, you, uh, we've said this many a time that a 20-minute walk demonstrated a 40% reduction in Alzheimer's risk. What does that? Absolutely. I mean, it was a very robust, real study. So start exercising, especially in the morning, but whenever you can, but especially in the morning. Get tired, get sweaty that's going to protect your brain more than your heart. Yeah, Aim, that, aiming at least for 150 minutes of uh, exercise per week. But optimal up to 300 minutes. Optimal would be up to 300 minutes, but also, you know, not, you know, uh, not to, uh, not to uh, kill yourself over perfection. Any progress is important, especially if people are just starting. Like you said, a 20 minute brisk walk every day would be phenomenal. Uh, actually, the reality is it's stepwise. Never jump to 300 to 150 minutes. It's small incremental successes. Start with five minutes of brisk walk and then make it 10 minutes after a week. Uh, make it 15 minutes after a month, whatever it is, systematically. So exercise is absolute necessity. The second thing is education, education, education. Now education doesn't mean formal going to school, although if you wanna take, I love the idea of taking classes uh, yeah. that I wanted to. You know, Now I'm taking all kinds of classes from business to art, to history, to philosophy, to engineering, to business. To, uh, I just took a. I, I just started taking a finance class on edX. Fantastic. edX has a lot of free, wonderful courses that you can enroll in, and sometimes they're self-paced. Sometimes you actually wow. do it with a team. Uh, you can audit for a class. So you can take a on, test. Yeah, we're going to be tipping people fifteen, not forty-five percent. <laughs> Okay, so the joke is that I always make a mistake. No, you don't make a mistake. You over calculating fifteen percent. I'm it's generous. Coming from your, yeah, it's coming I'm from your generous, generous heart. I'm yeah. kind. But forty five percent? That's not generous. That's, that's because I really like that server. She was amazing. I know, no, I'm joking. But <laughs> but so we're taking classes all over the place. I'm taking guitar. Yeah, I'm, I'm damaging many a eardrum. I'm re I'm learning a piano all piano. over again. So, so and writing songs. Do challenge your brain. Our meta-analysis showed that that's an incredibly uh, powerful thing to build resilience, build connectivity, build empowerment into the brain. Those are the, those just go without saying. You can't affect your genetics. You, uh, we, we, we'll talk about the hormones and that's still uh, something that needs to be uh, further clarified. But those two things and nutrition always. Absolutely. Although it's not in this list, nutrition always. No, nutrition is incredibly plant -centered, important. Plant-predominant, plant-based, but uh, as clean as possible. Well, I don't like the word clean because that basically as dirty means as possible. that, you know, the opposite is dirty. There's no such thing as okay. clean and dirty food. But, you know, like you said, a plant predominant or a plant based diet uh, based on what we've learned so far from the mind dietary patterns and the Mediterranean dietary patterns. It's very important to eat that way. I actually want to add another um, element uh -oh. in here for what our audience as well. Um, after or say d during the premenopause, menopause and postmenopausal changes. 
women tend to see an incredible change in how their lipids are metabolized in their body. There's going mm. to be actually a really major shift in their blood pressure and specifically in their LDL cholesterol. Yeah. And we know that LDL cholesterol is a major risk factor for vascular damage in the brain. So women going through premenopause or are postmenopausal need to really keep a very close eye on their LDL cholesterol yeah. and keep it managed. Um, as I said earlier, you know, the APOE4 gene and estrogen hormones and their real complex relationship affects how your LDL levels are. And with physical ac exercise, with uh, nutrition, if you can bring it down, that's great. But if you can't, it might be a good time for you to speak with your healthcare provider to see if you need treatment for that too. So that is a very, very important risk factor to keep in mind for women. Beautiful. Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about... A little kind of a general overview of what does these sex hormones do to our brain during the different stages of life. Now, we know that sex hormones in women, um, they're primarily estrogen and progesterone. They play a very important role in not only affecting brain function, but it affects brain structure as well as early as prenatal development oh, up to menopause. Now, I'm, I'm actually made some bullet points after reading some articles and from our textbooks. Um, let's talk about what happens during the prenatal development. So this is even before a person is born. During the prenatal stage, the foundation for the brain's architecture is established. And this process is directed by the action of the sex hormones on the developing neurons. Um, now, there's going to be... Um, sexual dimorphism, which is the differentiation between uh, the male and the female brains in certain areas of mm -hmm. the brain. And it actually begins during gestation mm -hmm. and it's influenced by these hormones. And so this process is called sexual differentiation and it includes structural changes in the brain that leads to sex specific behaviors and cognitive function in adulthood. It, That's it's amazing. fascinating. As, as early as, as, as pre-birth. I mean, so, you know, you kind of see these cartoonish it, representations. First, tri uh, first trimester and second trimester. Right. Trimester, yeah. And you get to see these cartoonish representation of like, you know, what was that book? Women's are from Mar Women are from Mars and men are from some other planet. Venus. Venus, it, yeah. Venus and Mars. Yeah. Something, something of that nature and how a woman's brain is more creative and a man's brain is analytical. I don't think it's, it's no. that, no. it's that stark, Correct. but. Can you give us some examples of what that actually looks like, the sex-specific behaviors? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we know that there are sex-specific behaviors that are um, encoded um, and and mapped out very early on. Now, I, I'm, we have to be very careful as far as behaviors. Um, uh, some people actually talk about behaviors, genetics of behavior. Uh, our behaviors, our complex behaviors are not genetically coded. The, the inclinations of behaviors, anxiety, um, uh, fearfulness, um, uh, openness, uh, tendency, uh, proclivity uh, towards, these, are, these can be uh, um, uh, coded. The same thing happens with, um, when, when uh, sex uh, hormones affect men to have um, th those kind of proclivities uh, th that men have and women uh, to have those uh, proclivities that women have. I know there's a whole lot of controversy uh, around this topic and we're not gonna get into that, but the, the short of it is that the hormones affect that manifestation tremendously early on, and that, tr and that manifestation is not binary. That's all I can tell you, and there's, it's much more complicated than that. And, and another talk, we'll get into this controversial conversation because at the end of the day, we're scientists. <laughs> yes. So, um, uh, that's, uh, that, but, but the, the tremendous effect of these hormones are on Neuronal growth, mm -hmm. they literally affect growth of neurons and birth of neurons exactly. and connectivity of neurons. And then also apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. The programmed cell death is critical because that creates the architecture. It's, imagine a house that has, uh, that's uh, 4,000 square feet but has 500 pillars. Well, that's not much of a house. You can't move around there. Imagine somebody coming in and taking out the pillars that are not necessary and leaving only the pillars that are necessary. That's what the, uh, the sex hormones do. So basically pruning. Pruning, pruning occurs. Correct, and, exactly. Um, the pruning occurs here and also later on around age three to five as well. 
throughout yeah, yeah I, I guess it it continues it to uh continues to happen at different rates correct um up to the age of 22 or 24 in different rates, in different exactly. rates right yeah. mostly during the postnatal and the you know four or five years of age correct which is fascinating i'm so happy that you highlighted the complexity of human behavior because there are a lot of uh, individuals and talking heads on the internet who simplify human behavior by saying things that, you know, for example, if a human being or if an animal was injected with factor X, it actually improved their mood or it, it got rid of their depression or it got rid of their anxiety. It doesn't work that no. way. Human behavior is so complex and there's so many uh, social, physiological um, and other factors that affect the outcomes. One of the biggest problems, again, this is a parascience concept, uh, one of the biggest problems uh, for humanity is our tendency is to slip to simplifying. Uh, one of the phrases I hate the most is, oh, it's common sense. Um, whenever there's a discussion and conversation that should have all the complexity come to the surface and somebody, somebody tries to dissuade and 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 cite uh, uh, you know uh, uh, push it aside by statements like oh it's common sense, it's not common sense. Um, the world is complex. We have to get used to the complexity and accept it in its complexity. And you see here when we're talking about hormone therapy and the, and and brain health, you will see the complexity and interplay of timing, other variables, the person's previous state, the per like education, exercise, and all of that stuff as well as the traumas and all these variables coming into interplay of this four-dimensional chess. And if we don't accept it as that and simplify it, say it is yes or no binary because I can only think that sense, then we've actually done this service to millions because of our own cognitive laziness. Love it. Thank you for that. All right. During early postnatal development, so when the baby is born, uh, we see the effect of the sex hormones on brain too. <clears throat> Um, there's a particular verbiage that's used in um, scientific papers. It's called wiring. So it, it affects the brain's wiring by influencing the patterns of the connections that are made between uh, neurons. For example, estrogen show, has been shown to enhance the wiring or synaptogenesis in hippocampus, which is the part of the brain that is uh, you know, responsible for encoding memory and emotions, etc. And it actually potentially contributes to understanding and encoding memory and processing of information. Um, and it also, uh, specifically estrogen, modulates the expression of various growth hormones, including BDNF. It's, you know, it's, an, uh, it's an, uh, downstream, uh, sorry, upstream hormone that affects multiple other hormones yeah. and neurotransmitters, including serotonin and dopamine. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Great. Um, so a notable example comes from studies um, on uh, what they call the critical period of brain development in which the brain is very, very sensitive to the organizing effects of these sex hormones. In animal studies, for instance, um, they've seen surges of testosterone in males shortly after birth before masculinization. And so there's so many incredible information that we have right now that shows that these hormones have very specific um, tasks and very general tasks as well in maintaining our brain function. And there are cer certain syndromes like Turner X syndrome and some other androgen insensitivity syndromes that shows us what happens to the brain when there are no receptors for these sex hormones. All right. Synaptic pruning and strengthening occurs du uh, during postnatal birth, very early in life. Estrogen also plays a very important role in increasing white matter, which is the myelination or that fatty substance that insulates axons and helps transferring of information from one cell to another or from one part of the brain to another. So estrogen actually helps um, codify that process of myelination. And, and myelination is so important. It, it speeds up thinking. It speeds up processing. It's, it's almost like the wire, the coating, the insulation around the wire. It's made of a fatty cell that coats it. And, and <clears throat> uh, why is this important? Although we haven't figured out the relationship very much, I mean, clearly, for example, MS, multiple sclerosis, as a disease of that wiring, of, that, of the myelin, especially the central nervous system, and women are at significantly higher risk of developing MS than men. And one of the things that people have found out is around age 13 to 15, if people move from certain region to another region, the risk goes 
higher or lower, lower depending on how close they get to the how close they get to the equator. Mm. So look at the combination of of location, distance from equator, which probably has to do with the heat or um, and myelination and age of onset of that risk, which is around the time of puberty and hormones. It's a complex picture. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, once we get that complexity, a lot of these diseases, including MS, will be better elucidated. Absolutely. One of the interesting things that, uh, that I read uh, was the impact of estrogen on the prefrontal cortex, um, especially during puberty, um, having two... <laughs> Having teenagers. two teenagers, <clears throat> we know how their brains actually change during puberty and during teen years. So I giggle a little bit and I was like, ah, that makes sense. But um, <laughs> the prefrontal cortex is a brain region associated with executive function, decision making, uh, planning, impulse control. Impulse control, <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, no, they're good. They're good kids. Uh, I'm kidding. Yeah, but, but I love uh, you, Alex and Sophie. Yeah. But uh, but it's it's fascinating how our brain goes through massive changes and shifts during puberty um, mm. because of the influence of these uh, sex hormones. Um, particularly estrogen influences the dendritic branching. Yeah, dendritic arborization. And the connectivity in this region, in the prefrontal cortex. Amazing. And it helps um, to shape its uh, <clears throat> maturation and function as well. So it's such a fascinating topic these sex hormones are not just you know random hormones that circulate it literally physiologically and structurally changes our brain and it's not just for sexuality we're talking about neuronal change brain structure change uh, myelination and then all the other hormones that are affected downstream and all the other neurotransmitters that are affected by them downstream absolutely so let's talk about what happens during menstrual cycle. So m during the menstrual cycle, um, there's fluctuation uh, in the levels of estrogen and progesterone, and this can influence cognition. It can affect mood. It can affect our stress response. There's been some research uh, and studies have shown that women's cognitive abilities can vary across the menstrual cycle. And it's because of the changes in their estrogen uh, levels. And, you know, PMS or premenstrual syndrome, the mood changes and the symptoms are also thought to be influenced by these hormonal fluctuation. The same kind of theory goes for pregnancy and postpartum as well. Um, during the postpartum phases, the abru abrupt drop in these hormones can contribute to uh, postpartum depression, to mood swings, to cognition, you know, women usually talk about mommy brain or, you know, not being there or not being able to process information as well as they did before pregnancy. I seem to have, uh, during that time, I had daddy brain, <laughs> but that was a different factor. <laughs> but uh, it, it really is. It's not something that is uh, an assumption. It actually is because of the fluctuation of these hormones. And then even the immune system is affected. Uh, um, uh, some of the diseases that are um, uh, autoimmune diseases actually um, uh, to a great extent, become um, uh, dormant during pregnancy. It's, it's remarkable that the effect of the hormones affect the immune system, which affects the disease. You see the relationship very clearly during pregnancy. And other things actually increase, which are the vascular diseases and vascular risk factors. And then we come to menopause, and, you know, it's a natural biological process, and it marks the end of a woman's menstrual cycle. And uh, during menopause, there is fluctuation of these hormones, and then there is a very steep decline in 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 the hormone levels, and so it physiologically and neurologically changes a woman's body. And during menopause or premenopause, women tend to have changes in how they process information. And because there are so many estrogen receptors in different parts of the brain, including the hypothalamus, the way we react to temperature, the way we react to a um, difficult, complex situation, the way we react to uh, multiple different physiological um, uh, activities, exercise, the way we eat, the way we feel, all of that gets affected. Good news is, I'm actually going to jump in now and kind of, you know, tell women that this is temporary. Sometimes people think that they stay postmenopausal or have these symptoms for a long time, but this is a very temporary thing. And with a healthy lifestyle, women are able to take care of themselves and lessen these symptoms during menopause. All right, so let's talk about the effect on cognitive function and what we know so far. So we did talk about the importance of sex hormones on brain growth and brain development, but we know that 
estrogen in particular has been found to have multiple neuroprotective roles later on in life, like promoting neuronal growth, modulating uh, synaptic plasticity, enhancing cerebral blood flow. And when there is a decrease <clears throat> in estrogen levels um, during menopause, it directly impairs these functions. And that's why people tend to have memory problems, loss mm -hmm. of concentration, um, uh, loss of uh, their ability to focus on something and, and play, pay attention to. Even executive function and pro problem solving. Exactly, yeah. And so, uh, so it, it definitely has been documented and yeah. women do have objective uh, findings in their neuropsychological testing. Uh, one of the other things that happens is sleep. Sleep is affected Absolutely. significantly. I mean, I can't tell you how many of my patients have come and said that I have memory issues and all of that. And, and the dominant feature that affected it was the, the, um, uh, the change in their sleep cycle. Absolutely. So, um, so all of these things, you know, affect uh, their, their effect on sleep, their effect on processing information, uh, their effect on vascular risk factors can put a woman at a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. There's been some research that shows that estrogen can promote the clearance of beta amyloid protein, you know, the bad protein that has been associated with Alzheimer's disease. And it can also reduce oxidative stress. It can reduce inflammation as well, or at least has a has a role in the reduction of these abnormal processes. So it is very, it's a very complex picture, but we understand that it has a major role in the development of Alzheimer's disease. Now let's talk about what we know as far as hormone replacement therapy is concerned. Hormone replacement therapy involves the administration of estrogen and or progesterone to alleviate menopausal symptoms. And um, this stage or the administration has given us some insight into the effect of these hormones mm -hmm. on brain during menopause. Now, some research showed that hormone replacement therapy can improve cognition. When people are on hormone replacement therapy, they can actually think better. They have less symptoms. They probably sleep better too mm -hmm. because of less, um, you know, physiological issues. Um, the sweating, issues. The, the, the night sweats, things the of that sweats, nature. The night sweats, yes, yeah. and the hot flashes. Mm -hmm. And so overall, women tend to have less cognitive issues uh, on hormone replacement therapy compared to those who are not on hormone replacement therapy. Um, as far as research goes, there is very contradictory information. Some studies show that women who are on hormone replacement therapy long term, they tend to do better, uh, which means they have less risk of developing cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. But then some other studies, like the one that just recently came out, shows that, no, it's the opposite. Women tend to have higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. And so we're kind of thrown into this loop of not really understanding what is going on and what mm -hmm. are some of the risk factors and what are some of the confounding factors that could potentially cause this. Absolutely. Um, and 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 the, the reality is that in the next few years, I'm, I'm very optimistic because we're seeing all these different areas, more information coming. I, I wish there was more funding for women's brain health and research, but nonetheless, we're getting, gathering all this information. And then it's at the interface of the, all this that we'll get a more meaningful um, uh, outcome in, uh, in the studies. Absolutely. So uh, <clears throat> if you don't mind, let's go into the, into a little bit of detail of what this contra uh, contradiction in the studies indicate. Now, some studies um, that have only looked at particularly estrogen therapy, um, they have shown that estrogen therapy has protective effect against Alzheimer's disease. And they essentially propose that estrogen may help maintain cognitive function, delay Alzheimer's symptoms because of all of the different mm -hmm. mechanisms that we discussed. Um, and th this recent paper that came out, I'm actually going to read a, a little bit, um, kind of just go into it. Um, so this was done in... Um, Denmark. It was a nation, nationwide nested case control study. And the objective was to assess the association between the use of menopausal hormone therapy and development of dementia um, according to the type of hormone uh, treatment. So this was not an interventional study? No, no, they no, basically so, so looked at the registries. Interventional study is that you identify the populations, then you give the one group the medication, you don't give another group the medication, so you're forward leaning. You're going forward with this study and you have more control over it. Case control is you look at the population and those that took it and not didn't take it and you're actually looking at the data backwards. Absolutely. The participants um, were about, um, you know, there were, there were about 5,589 incident cases of dementia 
and about 55,890 age match control. So they had a larger yeah. control. They oversampled the they control. They oversampled the control. And they were identified between the years of 2000 to 2018. So it was a pretty long, yeah. long period, 18 years. And this was a population. <clears throat> they were all Danish women. They were between the ages of 50 to 60 years in the year 2000, and they didn't have dementia. So they looked at healthy women, and they didn't have any contraindications for the use of uh, menopausal um, therapy either. And um, the results showed that compared to people who had never used hormone replacement therapy, women who received estrogen and progestin therapy, so the combined hormonal therapy, had an increased rate uh, for all-cause dementia. And the hazard ratio, so basically they had about a 21% increased risk of developing um, um, dementia. And th the longer the duration was, uh, the higher their risk was. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> so basically they, they, they basically looked at duration as well, which is something that usually is not seen. Um, this risk escalated to 74% mm -hmm. Um, increased risk who used hormone replacement therapy for more than 12 Women years. Women who used 12 years of it, right. yeah. Um, and they also found out that uh, the risk of developing dementia, and I'm reading it from the notes here to be specific, was positively associated with both continuous and cyclic estrogen progesterone therapy. Mm -hmm. So that was also a unique one. They actually looked at how often women took it. Was it in cycles or was it a continuous therapy? And they found out that there was an increased risk of um, dementia in both of these categories, more for the continuous, 31% increased risk for the continuous, and 24% for the cyclic estrogen progestin mm -hmm. therapy. And this was consistent even in women who had started the treatment at 55 years of age and younger. And that's important because there is a particular period, mm -hmm. a period of time that, that, that that's very important for starting hormone replacement therapy. In previous studies, more than whether someone should start hormone replacement therapy or shouldn't start hormone replacement therapy, that was not the question. The question was when. Exactly. That, or, that and critical how period. How close to that event. Right. And so it seems that even when they started earlier, um, they were at higher risk. Um, and when the researchers narrowed down their focus to late onset dementia and Alzheimer's disease specifically, the findings remained consistent. Mm -hmm. It was the same. So all cause dementia, late onset dementia versus Alzheimer's disease all looked the same. Um, so this was concerning. Yeah, absolutely. And this was a significant. The strength of this paper was that um, this study basically looked at all the other medications that these women were taking. So it wasn't that they were taking something else that could increase their risk factors. Um, and they also checked it a couple of times, so making sure that you know there was no recall bias. And a lot of these studies... You can't rely on women remembering whether they took their mm -hmm. medication or not. So they they they, they uh, controlled for that too. And so the bottom line was that this study suggested that menopausal hormone therapy, particularly the combined estrogen progesterone therapy, was associated with an increased risk of um, uh, overall dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. But the weaknesses were that it was retrospective. Uh, where you can't, when you're, it's retrospective, you can't control for a lot of variables. Right. And you don't even know what variables sometimes to look at. Um, uh, so, and then there was one, one particular country, one particular group of people. Um, uh, so those are, those are important factors uh, and, uh, as opposed to a prospective randomized controlled trial that you can actually know all the variables that, that, that's going into the, the study. Absolutely. A little bit of history. So menopausal hormone therapy um, has been in the spotlight as a potential risk factor contributing to this disparity in Alzheimer's disease. And um, treatment, uh, you know, hormone replacement therapy was widely prescribed before 2003. Mm -hmm. But then in 2003, the Women's Health Initiative Memory Study, which is in Harvard, they published a randomized uh, trial and they reported that estrogen plus progestin therapy was associated with a twofold increase in, in the risk of dementia among women who were older than 65 years of age. And so that's when, you know, it basically halted and people got scared and they uh, were very concerned about whether it should be started or not. Um, 
And then during this period, that's when the critical window of when hormone replacement therapy should be started, that was uh, introduced. And so um, the age of initiation seemed to be a crucial factor and women health specialists tried to focus more on that rather than not giving women a hormone replacement therapy. Um, now, like you said earlier, some of the factors that uh, were, were kind of, I wouldn't say missed, but some of the factors that could potentially confound this relationship was, you know, the socioeconomic status of mm -hmm. the women, their education levels. It was only done in one nation. So this clearly should not be um, a causal association. Uh, hopefully we can have better studies. Um, hopefully we can have randomized controlled trials mm -hmm. in multiple different um, cohorts that could elucidate the relationship between hormones and Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, I mean, if we if we want to figure out the, the multiple dimensions that go into a, a, a disease, you really have to have large populations that are diverse because then you can actually uh, take into account race, gender, education, um, um, uh, mobility, uh, lifestyle, um, uh, proximity of hormone, the lifelong um, uh, presence of hormone. When did the um, you know uh, uh, estrogen cycle start? When did it end? What other factors were there? That not, the amount of parity, um, uh, the, how it affected their sleep, their sleep underlying sleep problems, uh, the level of mental activity. As I said, not just edu education, but the, how they challenge themselves. All these things matter, and for that kind of a study that involves all those variables almost as equally. You really need a large, diverse population. I agree. And we don't have anything like that yet. I agree. I agree. Um, <clears throat> you know, some of the some of the factors that stood out for me was um, the increased dementia risk uh, in uh, women who were on hormone replacement therapy for a longer period of time. I don't think that's biologically plausible because when they did uh, the analysis, when women um, when women were given hormone replacement therapy of less than one year. You know, they also had increased risk of dementia. That's just not possible. Mm -hmm. So um, this further supports the presence of some confounding factors that were not really taken into consideration. Um, and so bottom line is, yes, the study was, you know, well done, well conducted. But uh, again, uh, we have to make sure that we don't take it as uh, a standard. direct association yeah. at, that's not causal. Um, we have enough data that shows that hormone replacement therapy, especially when started earlier in women 55 years and younger, could potentially be protective. So if women are going through menopause or are premenopausal or postmenopausal, they need to speak with their healthcare provider, especially someone who has a specialty in women's health about this and consider uh, going on hormone replacement therapy. But at the same time, understanding that lifestyle has a profound effect on brain health and not to kind of push that to the side no, because absolutely. it's usually done so unfortunately I think it's the dominant factor right, right. and and uh, focusing on the lifestyle element whether it's it's a risk or not a risk it's either going to mitigate but still the direction is positive or it's going to accentuate which means the direction is significantly positive but lifestyle is going to be the dominant factor there Absolutely. So I think the purpose of this conversation was to highlight uh, the, you know, the, the differences between um, a, you know, male and a female brain, um, the systematic differences in education, socioeconomic status, cognitive reserve uh, between um, these sexes, um, and the importance of amplifying brain reserve capacity, exercise and lifestyle and mental activity and mental activity during midlife and late life, because, you know, after menopause, women have higher, higher uh, chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. So all of these things need to be implemented as, as much as possible. And we have so much data, such strong data that shows that when women do implement a healthy lifestyle and take care of their hormone replacement therapy, if they, uh, if they don't have any contraindication for it, they do very well. Fantastic. All right. Any last words, Dean? Yeah. The last words are, although the data is not clear, and that's the case in a lot of medicine, lack of clarity does not mean um, paralysis. Uh, I want to make sure that that's not what comes out of this. Often we hear, oh my goodness, now this thing is bad for your health. I'm just going to give up on this lifestyle. 
um, or um, you know, we we keep changing our mind as far as research is concerned. That's not the case. We we do um, do change our mind on occasion. We we do um, uh, you know vacillate in our uh, ability to uh, manage the data um, and and get better and better. Uh, but reality is, we have a lot of data for brain health. This talk or any other talk we do is ultimately about brain health. As we get better clarity about the hormones, we, as you said it before and again, and I'm gonna say it again at the end, please institute an exercise program in your new life, one. That may be starting slowly, but be very diligent and systematically build the exercise. Very little has as much effect on your mood on your brain and on your health as a good exercise program. A daily brisk walk, if that's all you're going to do. Two, eat more plants, eat less saturated fat, eat less sugar and, and processed carbs, and, uh, and you'll do amazingly. We talked about just adding greens increases your brain health by 11 years. Um, three, build a good sleep program. Sleep is where your brain does the cleansing, and that's critical. And four, Mental activity, mental activity, mental activity. Challenge your brain around your passions and your brain will respond by can making billions of connections. Now, how the hormone story manifests in all of this, we will, I'm pretty sure in the next few years will we'll be more clear. Absolutely. And at this point, it's at the individual level. You and your doctor determining if you need hormones for not just for the brain, but for all the other systems in the body. And some people do and some people don't. Uh, but um, uh, but uh, reality is that when you take on the lifestyle variables and take and, and improve them, you'll significantly improve your brain health. Absolutely. If there's any good example of personalized medicine for brain health, hormone replacement therapy is it. Um, even though there is a lot of contradictions and confusion between observational studies and randomized control trials, it's very, very important for women to know that every individual is different and for them to really pay attention to the so-called critical window or the window of op opportunity, which is, you know, the specific age or the time when hormone replacement therapy is, is initiated. So having a conversation with a healthcare provider is so important. And of course, like you said, the implementation of lifestyle, especially during midlife, is critically important. And that's a wrap. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to stay up to date with future episodes, please subscribe and follow our podcast on Apple or Spotify and watch the recordings on our YouTube channel. We would appreciate you supporting this show with your review as it helps it reach more people. We look forward to connecting again in the next episode.